Beneath the surface of New York Harbor, volunteers scrub discarded oyster shells, working toward a goal no city has ever attempted, placing one billion oysters back into these polluted waters to reverse a century of devastation. In 1609, this was the world's most bountiful shellfish paradise until overfishing and industrial waste killed everything. Now, against all odds, life is returning. But what does it take for an ecosystem declared dead to rise again? And why trust oysters to save America's biggest city? Gloved hands plunge into piles of sun-bleached oyster shells, scrubbing away grit and stray bits of seaweed. On Governor's Island, the air smells of salt and limestone, and laughter carries across the curing yard. Families, students, retirees, and first-timers gather around long tables working side by side. Some arrive by ferry from Brooklyn or Manhattan, others by bike, all drawn by the promise of restoring life to the harbor. The task is simple but relentless. Each shell must be cleaned, sorted, and stacked, destined to become the foundation for a new reef. The scale is staggering. Buckets fill, barrels empty, and still the shells keep coming. Over 75 restaurants across New York City save every shucked oyster shell from their kitchens, sending them here instead of to the landfill. Each shell spends a year outdoors, weathered by sun, rain, and snow, until it is safe to return to the water. Volunteers move through the curing yard in a steady rhythm, scraping, rinsing, passing shells down the line. Children compete to see who can clean the most in an hour. A grandmother shows her grandson how to spot a shell big enough for a baby oyster to call home. No one here will see the full result of their labor today. The shells they clean will not be seeded with oyster larvae until next season. Still, every participant knows they are part of something bigger, a citywide effort with a deadline and a number that seems almost impossible. One billion oysters by 2035. That is the target. Each shell in a volunteer's hand is a step toward it. The work is repetitive, but the goal is anything but routine. A project on this scale is more than logistics and numbers. It is a movement that draws strength from the people who show up week after week to do the work no machine can replicate. The volunteers come from every borough, every background. Some are drawn by curiosity, others by the memory of a cleaner harbor told by older relatives. For many, it is a way to reclaim a connection to the water that once defined New York's identity. As the sun starts to dip behind the skyline, the pile of cleaned shells grows higher. The day's effort will soon be measured in tons, but for those who spent hours with their hands in the shells, the impact is measured in pride and hope. The harbor's future is being rebuilt, one shell at a time, by thousands of ordinary New Yorkers who refuse to give up on their city's water. The memory of what was lost lingers in the background, but here in the present, the work is all about what can still be restored. In September of 1609, Henry Hudson's ship sailed into a harbor unlike any other on the continent. Below the water's surface, oyster reefs sprawled across more than 220,000 acres, an expanse larger than the city itself. The reefs rose in jagged mounds, some so high that navigators marked them as hazards on their charts. Oysters were everywhere, anchoring the harbor's food web, filtering the tides, and softening the blow of every storm that rolled in from the Atlantic. For centuries, oysters shaped life in New York. They were the city's original street food, piled high on carts along bustling avenues, eaten by the rich and working class alike. Shells paved the alleys, filled the foundations of grand buildings, and lined the tables of every tavern the reefs themselves teemed with life, fish, crabs, and birds finding shelter in the labyrinth of shells, while the water ran clear enough for sunlight to reach the harbor floor. But abundance bred carelessness. As the city grew, its appetite for oysters became insatiable. 
By the early 1800s, commercial harvesters were pulling billions from the water each year, shipping them, by the barrel, to distant cities. The demand for lime to build and pave New York's streets meant that not just the meat, but the shells themselves were carted away, ground up, and lost forever. Industry followed. Factories lined the waterfront, their pipes pouring chemical waste and dyes directly into the estuary. The city's swelling population brought new waves of pollution. Untreated sewage flowed from tenements and row houses, turning the harbor into a dumping ground. Dredges flattened ancient reefs to deepen shipping lanes, erasing the three-dimensional structures that had taken thousands of years to build. Within a single human lifetime, the harbor's vast oyster beds began to vanish. By the late 1800s, the reefs that once covered the bay were reduced to scattered remnants. Water that had run clear turned murky and foul. The last commercial bed struggled on, but contamination grew worse with every year. In 1927, health officials ordered the final oyster grounds closed. The harbor, once one of the most productive estuaries on Earth, was declared biologically dead. What was lost was not just a delicacy or a way of life, but the very foundation of the harbor's ecosystem. The reefs that had filtered the tides, sheltered marine life, and protected the shoreline were gone. In less than a century, New York had destroyed 220,000 acres of living reef, a collapse measured not in headlines, but in silence. The water grew still, and the memory of abundance faded. Yet beneath the city's relentless drive, the harbor waited, empty but not forgotten, for someone to imagine what might be possible again. Pete Malinowski grew up with salt in his blood. On Fisher's Island, his family farmed oysters the old way, by hand, tide after tide, no shortcuts. He learned early that an oyster's work is slow, invisible, and relentless. That lesson stayed with him through college and followed him to New York City, where the water was darker, the stakes higher, and the memory of abundance almost gone. Years later, standing on the battered piers of Governor's Island, Pete met Murray Fisher. Murray had founded the New York Harbor School with a stubborn belief, give young people real responsibility and they will rise to it. He wanted a school where the harbor itself was the classroom, where students did not just read about restoration, but did it. Pete signed on as an aquaculture teacher and together they started asking questions nobody else dared. Why not bring oysters back? Why not trust teenagers to help lead the way? The idea sounded naive, even reckless. City officials and scientists doubted oysters could survive in water still haunted by a century of waste. Pete heard it all, too dirty, too ambitious, too slow for a city obsessed with quick fixes. But he remembered his family's farm, where patience and persistence paid off in every harvest. He saw the same grit in his students' faces as they hauled cages and measured salinity undeterred by setbacks or skepticism. Murray pushed for partnerships, grants, and city support, while Pete focused on the science, testing, failing, adapting, and trying again. Their first pilot reefs were small, more hope than proof. Still, each surviving oyster was a quiet rebuke to the doubters. The project grew, not because it was easy, but because Pete and Murray refused to accept that New York's harbor was beyond saving. Pete once said that if you want to teach someone to care about the water, you have to let them get their hands dirty. For him, restoration was never just about oysters or numbers. It was about giving people, especially kids, a reason to believe they could change their city, one shell and one season at a time. An oyster spends its life doing a job no machine can match. Each adult oyster draws water in through its gills, trapping tiny particles of algae, silt, and even pollutants in a sticky layer of mucus. What most people see as a shellfish is, in fact, a natural filtration engine, one that can process up to 50 gallons of water every single day. Multiply that by one billion, and the scale of transformation becomes almost impossible to ignore. The process is deceptively simple. Water flows through the oyster's body, 
and as it passes, suspended particles are removed. Nitrogen, a pollutant that fuels algae blooms and dead zones, is locked away inside the oyster's shell and tissue. This is not a temporary fix. Once incorporated, that nitrogen is out of circulation for good. The oyster's metabolism turns what would be waste into growth, and the shells themselves become permanent records of the harbor's changing chemistry. As more water is filtered, clarity improves. Sunlight, once blocked by clouds of suspended sediment, reaches the harbor floor for the first time in decades. Seagrass begins to grow again, laying down roots and providing both oxygen and refuge for young fish and crabs. The benefits ripple outward. Clearer water supports more life, and more life helps keep the water clean. This is the cascade effect at work. A single oyster's effort multiplied across an entire city's shoreline. Beyond filtration, oyster reefs build structure where there was only mud, the shells pile up, layer upon layer, creating a three-dimensional habitat that shelters hundreds of species. Small fish dart among the crevices, while larger predators patrol the edges. What was once a barren bottom becomes a living reef, as complex and vital as any coral garden in warmer seas. This is why the idea works. Not because oysters are exotic or rare, but because they are relentless, efficient, and perfectly suited to the job. Their biology is the blueprint for restoration. Not just cleaning water, but rebuilding the very foundation of an ecosystem. In the city's kitchens, the workday ends with a ritual that is easy to overlook. At Grand Central Oyster Bar, and at more than 75 restaurants across New York, staff scrape shells from plates, pile them into blue bins, and set them aside. These shells will not head to the landfill. Instead, they begin a journey that threads through the city's streets, across the harbor, and back into the water. Trucks collect the day's haul and ferry it to Governor's Island, where the shells are stacked in open-air curing yards, exposed to the elements for a full year. Rain, sun, and winter cold break down any lingering flesh or bacteria, transforming what was once waste into the raw material for restoration. This is more than a recycling program. It is a supply chain with a purpose. The year-long curing process is not just tradition. It is a strict public health requirement set by state and federal regulators to ensure no pathogens survive. Only after this waiting period, when the shells are clean and safe, can they be seeded with oyster larvae and returned to the harbor. People ask, can you eat these oysters? The answer is no. These reefs are off limits for harvest. They exist to clean water, not to fill plates. The rules are clear. Restored oysters are for the ecosystem, not the menu. Once the shells are ready, the next hands to touch them often belong to teenagers in rubber boots. Over 10,000 students from the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School and partner programs have worked the line, measuring, sorting, and preparing shells for the hatchery. In labs and on boats, students learn to rear oyster larvae, monitor water quality, and build reef structures that will survive the city's tides. What starts as a biology lesson quickly becomes a lesson in logistics, teamwork, and patience. The process is slow, but the scale is massive. Each year, thousands of pounds of shells move from restaurant tables to reef sites in all five boroughs. This closed loop, restaurant, curing yard, classroom, harbor, proves that restoration can be built into the fabric of everyday life. It is not just scientists or environmentalists driving the change, it is chefs, dishwashers, drivers, students, and teachers, all linked by the simple act of saving a shell. The city's appetite, once a force of destruction, now powers a supply chain that rebuilds the harbor, one meal and one lesson at a time. Survey divers slip beneath the surface, notebooks strapped to their wrists, counting oysters by the thousands, the numbers tell a story no one could have imagined a decade ago. 
more than 150 million oysters now anchor the harbor floor, spread across 17 acres of restored reef. Each spring and summer, crews seed another 50 million, tracking survival rates and growth, measuring progress site by site. The reefs are more than statistics, they are living structures, layered with new life. Fish school in the shadows, crabs scuttle between shells, and the water above grows clearer with every season. Divers record the return of species once missing from these waters, evidence that the experiment is working. Every data point, every shell counted, is proof that a city's faith in nature can be rewarded. The harbor's recovery is no longer a distant hope. It is happening one oyster, one acre, and one survey at a time. After Hurricane Sandy battered Staten Island in 2012, the search for better storm protection took on new urgency. Instead of building more concrete walls, planners turned to an idea rooted in the harbor's own history, living breakwaters. Backed by a $60 million grant from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, engineers and ecologists designed a chain of oyster-encrusted reefs stretching along the Tottenville shoreline. These breakwaters are not just habitat, they are infrastructure. Computer models and field tests show they can reduce wave energy by as much as 80% during storms, softening the impact before water reaches homes and streets. The price tag for this kind of resilience is striking. Building living breakwaters costs about one-third as much as traditional seawalls and comes with none of the maintenance headaches of concrete. For Staten Island residents, the calculation is simple. Every dollar spent on oysters and reef balls buys not just cleaner water, but a safer, more stable coastline. One that can adapt to rising seas and fiercer storms without sacrificing the life of the harbor. Maya Rivera grew up in the Bronx, just blocks from a stretch of river once written off as hopeless. She joined the harbor school as a freshman, unsure of her path but drawn to the promise of hands-on work. Four years later, she graduated with a certification in marine science and a job offer from a research lab studying urban estuaries. Maya's story is not unusual here. Over a decade, thousands of students have followed the same current from classroom to harbor, from curiosity to career. Their work has rippled outward. Neighborhoods once fenced off from the water now host kayak launches and fishing piers. Families gather on weekends to explore tide pools that did not exist a few years ago. The project's impact has caught the eye of city officials from Tokyo, London, and Cape Town, all eager to learn how a city can restore its waterfront by investing in its people. In New York, the harbor's comeback is measured not just in oysters, but in lives changed. Right now, New York's reefs are growing back, filtering millions of gallons every day, proof that restoration can outpace destruction. As sea levels rise and cities search for resilient solutions, nature's own engineers quietly rebuild the harbor's future. The world is watching to see if we let these oysters finish what they started. Sometimes, healing a city begins with letting the smallest creatures do what they do best.